to call upon my colleague, Bob Douglas, Professor of Geography, uh, to introduce Dr. Stanford. Well, good morning. Uh, it's really a privilege for me to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Dennis Stanford. Uh, Dennis was born in, uh, in Rollins, uh, which is a small town in Wyoming. I checked, uh, it's a little over 8,000 population now, but uh, I'm sure when he was there it was a lot less. Uh, when he was about 10 years old, he started finding arrowheads. Sometime later, a local contractor accidentally dug up what turned out to be mammoth bones at a kill site. Dennis was invited to join this archaeological, uh, archaeological crew. Well, the rest is history, a lifelong interest in the origins of the first people to come to America. Uh, in 1961, he enrolled at the University of Wyoming, and then he earned a master's and a PhD in anthropology at the University of New Mexico. Right out of graduate school, he got a job with the Smithsonian Institution which had just initiated a program of the study of paleo Indians, and he's been there ever since. One of the things that I um, really liked about the work that, that Dennis does is his interest in trying to figure out how the first humans made and then used stone tools. I first saw him do this, um, what, what's called experimental archaeology, in a 1980 video called Seeking the First Americans. Now, in case some of you don't know what experimental archaeologists do, I want you to watch this uh, part of this tape just very briefly. So, Matt, if you can get your folks to put that on. <clears throat> cut on Stanford's hand was to the bone. The bison is useful not only as a source of meat, Dennis Stanford and Vance Haynes are preparing strips of sinew from the animal. Dry it out, split it up. These can be used with the bison's blood as glue to bind a clovis point to the foreshaft of a spear. For a few hours early one morning, before the sun grew hot, the Wyoming Plains sounded with the faint echo of a scene played out here over thousands of years by the great hunters of the past. Yes, you can applaud that if you... Uh... <clears throat> well, this is what some archaeologists do when they're not at conferences. Um, it's, uh, I also want to tell you, it's not a preview of what you're having for lunch, so um, don't get too worried. Um, what Dennis is best known for right now is... Uh, what's called the Salutrian Hypothesis, which contends that Clovis points, which they made there and were working on that bison, uh, those date back to around 11,000 years, uh, and they derive from similar points uh, developed thousands of years earlier in an area of Spain. And uh, this is uh, somewhat of a revolutionary uh, hypothesis that's been developed that uh, uh, Europeans were here in America very, very early. Um, I'd like you to welcome uh, uh, Dennis Stanford uh, and to talk about this. He's an institution at the Smithsonian Institution. Dennis Stanford. <laughs>
Thanks, Bob. Uh, that was the uh, most interesting introduction I've ever had. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, folks. Uh, it really is good morning to all of you. I really uh, appreciate uh, the invitation to come and speak here. I especially appreciate Dr. Robinson, who had to chase me last winter trying to get an answer from a guy stuck in four feet of snow in Colorado. But we finally got together, and here I am, and I'm really glad we made it. Um, this has been a marvelous experience, a very marvelous experience. And I want to uh, thank uh, the whole organizing uh, committee, uh, Bob, for this wonderful introduction, and uh, <clears throat> Eric and Jalissa. Uh, who have been so uh, kind and helpful here on campus in showing us around. Um, I think you're going to enjoy what I have to say today, and you're going to see the results of research that are uh, quite new and as yet unpublished. And by quite new, I mean uh, I'm, I'll show you some slides today that uh, are of work we've done in the last couple of weeks. So um, let's get started. Um, the Iberian Connection, or the constructing the Salutrian solution, uh, is basically what I'm talking about here, as Bob mentioned, is a complete reversal of the peopling of the Americas model. Uh, what we see, I want to talk about the uh, uh, slide that's up right now. Uh, this slide was taken about three years ago uh, in uh, March on the Arctic Ocean off the coast of Point Barrow. Now one thing Bob didn't mention is that I spent uh, most of my graduate career working in Alaska and working with Native Americans and wrote my dissertation on the Thule Eskimos. And so for several years I actually participated in a lot of these hunts on northern ice flows and cooperating and working with these people. So when the British BBC wanted to film uh, a reenactment of uh, a potential migration, uh, we contacted some of my old friends who were actually young friends back in the 60s and are now whaling captains and, and, and uh, elders in the community, uh, which made me feel kind of bad because uh, I, I was older than they were, and now they're elders. Nonetheless, they were quite happy to come out uh, bring a whaling uh, umiak, which is what you see here. Uh, we took it out to one of the ice leads on the Arctic Ocean uh, with a complete film crew and the whole whaling crew. Incidentally, the uh, uh, master whaler here and owner of the boat, his name is Jonah. I thought you would like that. This is the Jonah Levitt crew. Now the thing I want you to remember about, there are several things I want you to remember about this picture. The first is that there is a 20 knot wind blowing and it's 40 below zero. Now, what do you think about the wave development on the Arctic Ocean? Look at it. When you get in those ice leads, you are pretty well protected until the ice lead shuts. Uh, and when it shuts, if you're a smart Eskimo hunter, you just paddle your, your umiak up onto the ice and sit it out, sit out a storm, and then go for a new, new lead. Now the last thing I want to tell you about this slide is it was taken by Peggy Jodry, my wife. And uh, she has been a, a constant companion and somebody who has helped with the formulation of a lot of our ideas that Bruce and I have had and been a, a constant help in our research, and I want to thank her. <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear Scott's talk last night about Clovis, I want to very briefly talk about what Clovis is in terms of technology and its spread around the country. Clovis was first found in the 30s. Uh, this is the Clovis projectile point right here. Uh, it is recognized because of its distinctive flute. Can, 
Can you see this? Do, 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 do. That's a flute. Uh, those occur on both sides of the projectile point and it's flaked on both sides. In other words, it's what archaeologists call a biface artifact, a bifacial artifact. Most of the Paleolithic archaeology in the whole world is unifacial. In other words, large flakes and blades that are dressed up on one side only and minimally on the other side. There are several cultures, Paleolithic cultures, that do bifacial technology. Almost everybody in the New World, Salutrian in Europe and Silesian in Eastern Europe. Other than that, you get a little bit of bifacial technology post Clovis throughout Siberia. And, and that, I think, may be an important point to, to remember. So uh, Clovis was first found uh, in New Mexico with uh, mammoth, as you see here in the slide. And uh, immediately, uh, everybody considered Clovis to be big game specialists that hunted mammoths almost exclusively because for the next 20 years, every Clovis site we found was associated with a mammoth. Uh, so that made pretty good sense. And every Clovis site we found was at in a stratified deposit, at least, at the very bottom level. So it became quite clear to archaeologists that Clovis were the first people in the New World. And about the same time, geologists working in uh, the Arctic had discovered that there was an ice-free corridor uh, and, and a, a Bering land bridge. And since we all know that Native Americans came from Asia, and Clovis were the first Native Americans. They crossed from Asia, crossed the land bridge, waited for the gla great glaciers to melt apart, and then scampered down through the ice-free corridor and ate all of the um, megafauna on their way to South America. That's what you learn in the textbooks, right? Well, that's a good idea. Uh, and in graduate school, I decided it would be a good thing to spend part of my career on is working in the Arctic and finding the origins of Clovis. Well, some 30 years passed and we did not find the origins of Clovis. And uh, it, it got to be a little uh, disconcerting, but we always said if we could ever get into Siberia, there it would be. Right in front of us, of course. Well, finally, uh, with Glasnost and the opening up of uh, the Soviet Union and Russia finally. A number of us got to uh, visit collections in Siberia, work with uh, Siberian archaeologists, and uh, turns out there isn't much in Siberia that even looks like Clovis. Back 30,000 years ago, people who made wedge-shaped cores where they struck microblades off of these micro cores sectioned them into straight pieces and used an osseous material. Uh, in this case, it's uh, a bison scapula, but ivory or antler, they would slot it. And then the uh, straight pieces would be uh, inserted into the slot. And these represented both projectile points and knives. This is a totally different technological adaptation to weaponry than Clovis. And it moves into northeastern Asia about 29,000 years ago, and it maintained its primacy as technology until people moved into Alaska, crossing the Bering Land Bridge, but not moving much further south until after Clovis times, because as we know now from new geologic work, the ice-free corridor did not open up until after Clovis people were here. Whoa, bad news, huh? So along with these new realizations, uh, a number of uh, uh, really good databases began to be put together. The one that's on the screen right now is uh, in part based on uh, Anderson, Fott, and Gillum, who started the Clovis database uh, out of the University of Tennessee. and. Uh, They've done an excellent job for us and, and have enlisted state archaeologists to uh, provide uh, data on Clovis artifacts uh, for the database. And as that database began to take form, some things 
really started to stand out to me at least, and that is that the biggest concentration of Clovis people is in the east and southeast, uh, the Trans-Appalachia area. And if you look at the, these colors, the orange, yellow, and dark green, these are the major areas where lots and lots of Clovis projectile points artifacts have been found. And as you move westward, you get fewer and fewer. In fact, you can see we, uh, at the Smithsonian, we overlaid uh, the map that they put together on the distributions with the river systems. And we begin to see, even though it is a computer-generated uh, model, that it looks like they're moving to the headwaters, uh, moving westward. Uh, once hitting the headwaters, then the next group, next wave, is moving further west till they hit the headwaters of the second degree uh, drainages. And then finally, a few folks getting out through the northern plains, southern plains, and some folks getting up into northern Mexico, uh, and a pretty good com uh, uh, number of them here. But most of this area out here in the far west was not inhabited by Clovis people, at least. Uh, one thing I want to make perfectly clear is that Clovis were Perhaps the ancestors of Clovis may have been the first people to come, may not have been. We don't know because we really don't know what's going on here on the West Coast. And there may be pre-Clovis people coming into North America from Asia, likely before uh, <clears> or <throat> along the, the uh, uh, Pacific Coast, and probably by boat. Uh, so that, that's kind of interesting. Then the next thing that begins to take shape here as you look at this map is the radiocarbon dates. And just recently a paper has been published by uh, uh, Waters and Stafford that points out that most of the radiocarbon dates for Clovis are around 10,900 years of age. And that's a pretty interesting time because right at 10,900 years ago, there was an abrupt climatic change from a warm period that, that developed after the end of the last glacial maximum or, uh, that's called the Younger Dryas. And the Younger Dryas overnight practically turned all of the Northern Hemisphere cold. And that was at 10,900 and we started looking at all these dates and we go, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting correlation there. What does it mean? But in their database, they left out a couple that I kind of and, and uh, a little bit partial to, and they're older than the rest. And uh, when asked about that, they said, well, you know, we weren't sure they're Clovis, so we dropped them. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, they didn't fit your model, did they? I'll get back to these sites a little later. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the concentration, density of sites and artifacts, Clovis artifacts in eastern North America, I want you to look at the red dots on the eastern shore of the Delmarva Peninsula here, this area here. Uh, there are more, and these are actual Clovis sites, and to be counted, even though they're all, 100% all surface sites, uh, they all have to have, in order to get elected as a Clovis site, uh, at least three diagnostic artifacts. Otherwise, they're what we call an, an I.O. or a, an independent find. Um, there are more Clovis sites. This is, uh, can you see the scale here? That's 20 kilometers, I think. I can't read it here. But uh, look at there's how many Clovis sites do you see here? There are more Clovis sites on this little chunk of Delaware, Virginia, and Maryland than there are in the entire Rocky Mountains westward. And that begins to tell you something. Now, there are many ways you can um, consider that data. Uh, and one of them is that, well, you know, they came in from the northwest here by boat came down the, uh, 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 went up the Columbia, down the Missouri, and then off to the east. And they found that the living in the east was really good, so they uh, were for fruitful and multiplied, and we get a big population here. 
Well, that may be true, but all of the dates are at the time of the worst environmental crisis in North America until this year. So I, I, I'd like to see them being fruitful and multiplying and getting so many people living out here. And I'll show you some, some geologic information that'll back that statement up. The other thing that we found that was quite interesting, uh, I, I should also point out that, that Bruce Bradley uh, is co-author of the book that uh, is being published by uh, the University of California Press. And a lot of the new research that I'm going to present today is with uh, a graduate student from the University of Delaware uh, named Darren Lowry, uh, geologist uh, Dan Wagner, and soils uh, archaeologist uh, John Waugh. Okay, so Bruce and I were looking at uh, caches. And caches are where people take a whole bunch of things and for whatever reason they bury them with the intent to come back. And Clovis people made these caches. And we have probably a right around a half a, a dozen or so of them now. But we had analyzed these caches for raw materials. And the artifacts are generally bifaces that are left in the caches, or bifaces, projectile points, other tools, and usually quite large. So uh, the, the, uh, they're actually what we think are material stockpiles. And as these people are exploring and moving up these rivers, they're taking with them the rock they need for their tools in the future. And when they get far out onto unknown territory, they take a portion of those and bury them in a place they can remember to come back to. And uh, as you can, as then they move on. If they find a new source of rocks, then they they feel good, and then they can move on to put another cache out a little further and further. You see the idea here. And when we analyzed what we called those specimens made from exotic raw material, in other words, rocks that were from a, over 150 miles away, we began to see a, a pattern developing. And that was a pattern of people moving from a quarry here on the Edwards Plateau out to eastern New Mexico and the Llano Estacado, stashing their stuff, then likely moving on. Here's another uh, quarry source uh, in the panhandle of Oklahoma moving up, and so on. And we begin to see that there's a general pattern from the um, east to the west. Not always. Uh, in fact, I just learned from Scott yesterday about a, a new uh, cache has been rediscovered basically here in Minnesota in which the, all of the raw material for the most part uh, comes from a, a source in Illinois. So we're even beginning to see that up in, in, in your area here. Uh, now, why are those caches there? They didn't need them. They didn't come back to them. That's because there's more excellent church sources out in here than there is anywhere, uh, a, a beautiful colored flint, just, uh, you, you don't, didn't need the caches. So they probably didn't go back unless there was, of course, you know, the ones they went back to will never find. But uh, nonetheless, I think it's beginning to show us uh, exactly how this works with a, a, a people that are exploring. And there is a major difference in sites between the green ones and these out west, and that is that the green ones are big sites, like the Carson Con Short site in Tennessee is a mile and a half long with a midden of about uh, uh, half a meter to a meter deep. And many sites like that, and most of them associated with quarry. So we're looking at a lot of occupation. When you, when you get out in the west and midwest, western midwest and on west, all you see are these small campsites and kill sites, very few people. So I think what we're looking at is maybe long distance rangers, explorers uh, moving west, and then when they get out in this area, they meet their neighbors, and it probably wasn't pretty. Now the final straw that, that broke my back, at least, was the discovery in Virginia of a site called Cactus Hill, which is southeast uh, of uh, Richmond on the Nottoway River, for those of you who uh, know Virginia. And at this site was stratified, starting off the colonial time period, moving back through like pages of books, 
uh, down to Paleo-Indian time periods, and then a nice Clovis level with classic Clovis stuff. And then a few centimeters below that, they found the unspeakable, another occupation level that apparently wasn't Clovis. And boy, did that cause a big stir amongst the Clovis first people. In fact, it's so easy to look at these, and yeah, there, there's a relationship here in terms of bifacial technology. Uh, we have a blade technology, which Clovis also has a well-developed blade technology. But the difference between these projectile points is that these uh, in the lower level were not fluted, like the Clovis with their nice flutes from the base. These are not fluted. And the radiocarbon date came back, and guess what it was? 16,900 years old. Now that really upset the Clovis first people, because that's about 5,000 years older than Clovis. Oh, too bad. <laughs> but it was only a few centimeters apart, so the date had to be right. Oh, okay. But one thing that occurred to me at the time uh, was that uh, these projectile points and the blade technology look remarkably like salutrian. And Bruce, this is Bruce here. This is my wife, Peggy. That's me, uh, in case you didn't recognize me. Uh, Bruce had talked about a, a, a technique called overshot flaking, which was used uh, as a purposeful technique by the Salutrian people and as a purposeful technique by Clovis people. Uh, you see it in almost any uh, lithic technology, but when you see it in cultures that are not those two specific, cultures, it usually represents a mistake made by the flint napper and usually results in a broken artifact. But these people were such skilled flint nappers, they were able to control that percussion, setting up the proper platform, and thinning their biface reel rapidly. Uh, and, and it's an excellent technique once you learn it but very few people learned it, and Salutrian flint nappers and Clovis flint nappers were about the only ones uh, up to that point in time, at any rate. So Bruce had uh, talked about that for a number of years, so when I saw the uh, Cactus Hill artifacts, I said, Bruce, you know, there may be something to this Salutrian Clovis connection. Uh, let's take a look. You know, I've been talked about, uh, number of professional archaeologists that say, oh, that stuff sure looks like Salutrian, or that Salutrian stuff sure looks like Clovis, but nobody was serious because, you know, you had the Atlantic Ocean out there. Uh, and there was five, 6,000 years of difference in time, so eh, it's independent invention, convergence, whatever you want to say, and it was totally ignored. Well, in the meantime, we figured out that, you know, over in the Pacific, 40,000 plus years, Folks were sailing around boats. Now boats are a pretty good idea, aren't they? They kind of change your perspective of the world because oceans, lakes, rivers, waterways in general, no longer are barriers, but they are highways. So let's go to France, let's go to northern Spain and look at those Salutrian artifacts and see how they really do, might, how they really might relate to Clovis. So it was a hard job, somebody had to do it, and we did. <laughs> now, what we found even surprised us. Uh, this is a, a typical Clovis point. Here is a not particularly typical Salutrian point, but a type of Salutrian point that only occurs in the Franco Cantabrian area of the uh, Salutrian occupation. And we found in at least two sites potentially fluted points. Well, that's kind of cool. 219, 19.5, that's cool. Then we found that the core and blade technology revolving around three types of cores, wedge-shaped cores, uh, conical cores, and uh, smaller uh, uh, circular cores, occurred and manufacturing techniques were the same. 
That's getting a little exciting. In fact, by the time we put our database together, we found that there were 32 almost perfectly good comparisons or, or fits between Clovis and Salutrian. In Siberia and all the work that my colleagues and myself have done in the Beringia, Siberia, Eastern Asia, if you find one of these technologies at any one time period, you've done a major find because they just do not exist. Uh, you, every now and then you see something. You can make up a list that you can match these in Siberia and when you look at the radiocarbon dates of the sites that you had to cherry pick to get these technologies out of, you span 18,000 years of time. Subtract 18,000 from 2008. That puts you back into Salutrian times. I want you to remember this. Uh, these are the overshot flakes that Bruce was excited about, Francois Board was excited about. This is a real technology. And I want you to remember this particular specimen, which is Salutrian, uh, because I'm going to come back to it later. This is the Clovis version. Uh, there are a number of scraper types that are one-to-one -one that do not exist in the rest of the European Paleolithic technology. So we're, we're seeing a, a really close tie between the uh, Clovis and Salutrian technology. Uh, we're also seeing some non-technological issues, such as raw material sources. Both Clovis and Salutrian people went out of their way to find the prettiest, most workable stone they could, and when possible, they flaked quartz crystal. These are uh, uh, examples of Clovis artifacts made out of quartz crystal uh, from North Carolina to Idaho. And if there's quartz crystal, you know they're doing it. Uh, Salutri guys did the same thing. These caches that I talked about earlier, they're caching these oversized uh, artifacts. Uh, there are 23 Salutrian caches and we're getting up to uh, over a dozen Clovis caches, and this is one of our Salutrian caches called the Drake Cache. Uh, this is a cache that's in Colorado, northern Colorado, but the raw materials are from uh, Texas. And this is the Vogu Cache. Uh, these are only examples. I think there's 17 or 18 artifacts here and about the same here. And a lot of times these two particular caches are just bifaces. In most of the caches there's a wide range of uh, tool types. The osseous antler ivory bone tool assemblage from Clovis and Salutrian are just practically one-to-one -one with atlatl hooks, uh, what the French call sagays, uh, which are bone projectile points. In fact, the patterning on this one from Florida is almost identical to one from uh, uh, France, uh, but that's got to be a, a, a total accident. But nonetheless, uh, shaft uh, wrenches uh, there's a shaft wrench that's identical to this from France, and, and numerous bone tools, including, and this is important, eyed needles. Uh, Salutrian and, and uh, Clovis and a modern needle here. Uh, the eyed needle is probably the most important artifact we've looked at yet today, because we have to remember that the Salutrian people, according to uh, the geneticists moved into uh, France and Spain around 22,000 years ago, or at the height of the last glaciation. So these people were living in polar and subpolar conditions. They needed waterproof clothing. They needed good all-weather clothing. They needed excellent shelters, all kinds of artifacts they needed in order to survive the Ice Age of Europe. And uh, the eyed needle is, is right up there and at the top of the list. And it was uh, carried to the Americas. Art. The Salutrian people are known for their artwork. Clovis people aren't. Uh, but Clovis people are staying out of caves. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I could give you some thoughts on that. But nonetheless, they both have portable art. 
And uh, portable art consists of everything from scratches, designs, to anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figures. And I kind of like this particular group because these are all showing arrows or spears stuck into hapless critters all the way from uh, Italy, across Spain, and out to Galt, Texas. And uh, using the same motif, but then again, if you're going to draw a spear with feathers on it, that's probably what you'd come up with. So we put our database, and it's been simplified here, uh, into a cluster diagram, and we find that pre-Clovis, now we haven't talked about pre-Clovis yet, pre-Clovis consists of uh, Cactus Hill and um, <clears throat> the Meadowcroft site, which is a site in Pennsylvania that has an early date uh, that's been highly controversial, and about three more sites that I will name in a minute. Uh, the clue, our, our fluted point data, Clovis, and these cluster together, which is the pre-Clovis, Clovis, Clovis uh, late French Salutrian, middle French Salutrian, and northern Spanish Salutrian. Then our Arctic materials from Siberia and Alaska, Ninana, Mesa Sluiceway, uh, Denali, and Ushki, uh, and Duktai, all cluster together, and then the classic uh, French European uh, Paleolithic people all cluster together. And I think that's uh, telling us some interesting things. So at that point, Bruce and I said, well, maybe we have a hypothesis here that uh, deserves some testing and we should push it a little further and see exactly how this might have worked. Because uh, it's beginning to be pretty clear to us that there has to be a historic relationship on the account of not only the technological, but uh, other non-technological uh, cultural traits that they have in common. So here's a picture of Europe in the last ice age. And these are Salutrian sites. These are, this is the continental shelf here. Uh, and uh, a little bit of England showing up, a little bit of Ireland. Uh, but notice that the North Sea English Channel, uh, the continental shelf out here, is all, would have all been open territory for people to exploit. Unfortunately, all our models of the European Paleolithic are based on non-coastal sites, uh, which is too bad. Uh, but there is really no way to, uh, you just don't have the data from the stuff that's uh, a couple hundred feet underwater, but it is out there. Um, for instance, uh, this is a, a, a group of people that are uh, dredging up mammoth bones off the uh, coast of France. Uh, these mammoth jaw bones, lots of mammoths. This is one day's catch. Pretty good catch. Here's another group that's dredging up bones uh, off the coast of uh, Holland, and what makes an archaeologist's heart weep is this picture, because that's a dumpster. And what they have done is gone through their dredge pile and sorted out the bones that won't sell to the nature stores and throw them into these dumper, dumpsters. And then the good bones that people say, oh, that's pretty, I'll buy that black bone. It's a mammoth bone from wherever. Uh, and they get shipped all over the world. And it's not against the law. And this, spirally fractured, butchered bones are taken to the city dump. Probably two or three of these a month. So you know that our paleontological and archeological record of the North Sea, at least around Holland, is, uh, getting ruined. And it's odd to me that no artifacts turn up in these activities. I have to think about that for a while because we know that the British Historic Trust has been mapping the North Sea floor and they've come up with 150 Paleolithic sites and artifacts. So where are these artifacts going? So, at any rate, to get back to our Salutrian people, here we are on the north coast of Spain. Uh, this is today, a uh, picture, once again, another picture Peggy took. Uh, here are the high picos during Salutrian times. This whole area back through here was glaciated. 
permanent snow line was down here. And then we have cave sites such as Altamira here. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, uh, these are all high elevation sites. So when you look at the whole picture, here we go. This is La Riera Cave, which is excavated by uh, Strauss and Clark. Really probably one of the best excavated Salutrian sites there is, and it's well reported, and they did an excellent job of excavation. It sits right here, which is about uh, 10 to 15 kilometers from the present day seacoast. But if you drop the sea level down from here, see where that buffalo is pointing his head, that little bench? That's today's sea level. You drop down off that limestone bench, and I'll bet you there's a bunch of caves and rock shoulders right there that won't quit. And you come out here another 10 to 20 kilometers, and you hit the beach. Now, the resources that are up here are red deer and ibex, primarily available uh, in, in the fall, where these resources out here on the territory that's now underwater and perhaps even expanding out over the English Channel is a fair number of larger animals, horses, bison, mammoth we now know, uh, plenty of good big game. Uh, there's also a number of sea mammals that are coming in. Uh, fish, we get the Andromedus fish coming up uh, to La Riera Cave. Uh, and then we have seals and sea mammals and, and deep sea fish. Now, the, the question is, uh, and, and I was really excited to hear Curtis's paper yesterday about the real early use of, of the sea coast. And, and he had his catchment circle there, which uh, gets truncated by the coast because they're in warm waters. Our sea coast is in frozen water much of the year, and so the catchment basin includes the ice rafted area here. So all of these animals are available to people. There's also other resources available here, and that's driftwood. Now think about it, we're in a, a polar desert here, and wood's a pretty expensive commodity. Uh, yeah, there's some scrubby stuff around, but you need some pretty big pieces of wood to build spears and, and maybe even houses. Uh, but it's coming in from North America as driftwood and being carried right into the Cantabrian uh, area of, of uh, northern Spain. So there are things called catcher beaches. And I think that's probably where main campsites are going to be set up. And catcher beaches are usually related to estuaries where you can get the uh, uh, other types of uh, mollusks. Now, driftwood, let me go back to driftwood for a minute. Driftwood is so important in the North Atlantic that in Iceland, medieval Iceland, people actually owned stretches of beach for the driftwood. And if anybody got picked up, picked up driftwood on somebody else's beach, they could be hung. Check it out. It's really important. Now, what we find at La Riera, though, is during the early Salutrian time periods, people are coming up to that cave with uh, um, limpets. And there's, in the first, in three levels there, there are hundreds of limpets. And that's a long way to haul limpets. And there's also uh, uh, sea bass and, and salmon, uh, sea trout, I mean, and, and salmon. And those bones are showing up, but, in, in, uh, but a lot of them appear as though they weren't particularly pop, uh, used, utilized. And the bones that we see in those levels, they're, they're clearly killing uh, the red deer and the ibex, but the meat-bearing packets are being carried someplace else. In other words, they're doing some butchering, uh, primary butchering in this area, and then the mate and meat is being hauled off. So they're taking it someplace. My guess is down here, which is to the uh, coastal sites, now underwater. Uh, and it's also in those same three levels that all of the concave base projectile points are located. So hang on, folks. Now. If you are sitting on the beach 
and you're hungry and all of a sudden a big wind blows in and your ice comes crashing into shore and you look out and you see this view. These are harp seals. This particular photograph was taken a couple years ago off the coast of Canada. Uh, today the harp seal population is over four million and that's with a extremely active program to eradicate the harp seal. And I think if I were a Paleolithic hunter and I was sitting on the beach and these things floated in, I'd say, um, let's eat. <laughs> Seals and the great auk, sea mammals and the great auk, are probably the most prized game these people surviving an ice age environment could get. They're big bags of fat that energy you need to survive in that kind of environment. And uh, you can render seal fat into oil in the sun. If you have a, a slow flame, you can render it just by hanging it up, or you can put it in your, next to your body in a little bag. And I, I, out of experience, I can tell you that's no fun. And uh, it'll drip into the bag from your body heat. So it's really important, this stuff. So I think that uh, uh, living by the beach is a good idea, but now we have no evidence of it. Well, wait, 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 wait. Let's go back to uh, La Riera Cave. And uh, here we have over in side B, uh, level seven through 17, uh, Salutrian levels. And because of the good work of um, a, a Spanish paleontologist uh, who, who was able to look at the wear and eruption, on the mandibles of the red deer, he knew within a few weeks of when each of those, uh, when those animals were killed, which gives you a seasonality of occupation. And when we look here, we can see that they were hunting in La Riera Cave in level seven all year round. But after level seven, this may be moving into town, uh, they're not doing much hunting in La Riera Cave from January through May. All right, now let's go to the E side, the A side of the chart, and look at what's best time to be hunting seals, harp seals, harbor seals, bearded seals, hooded seals, great auks. Is this time of year you're going to want to be on that coast? Well, that's kind of counterproductive to those of us who didn't grow up in the Arctic. We want to get someplace warm. We want to get down the Riviera. Well, they wanted to get right up on that ice because that ice, when it becomes extended onto the land. You can move out on it, you can live on it. And the more people you get at seal blowholes, the better your chances of getting enough animals to survive. Now, did they do it? Who knows? But I'd say the rock art is our first big clue that they did. And to me, this looks like either a bearded seal or a walrus in a net. Here's another one with a spear, another one with a spear. Uh, here's some earless seals. Uh, these are the great auks. Uh, we have a, a fair number of pictures of those. Those animals breed and pretty much live offshore. Now let's look at these guys. Who do you think they are? We have uh, a tuna and maybe a halibut. How many of those you ever see wash up on a beach? Particularly looking like they're alive. I'd say these guys were watching that shore pretty carefully. And I'd say they probably have figured out how to get them. And when we finally figured out what the Clovis Total Toolkit Weaponry Endpoint package was, is we had the fluted point inset, which is what the flute's for, into a harpoon type arrangement, which is then in, inserted, a, a, a four shaft is inserted into that. And then you go out and you stab your poor critter and you pull your, 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 your spear back and uh, if you have a line tied to that or uh, whatever, you can load up again and take another shot. This is, this is classic harpooning equipment. Now, uh, this is supposed to be uh, 
an, an interactive a video, which uh, apparently is not working here, but I want to explain it to you because up here in the corner, uh, we have a, a chart showing the changes of the uh, uh, water temperature of um, uh, the North Atlantic starting here at 22,000 when the Salutrian people come into Northern Europe, it was quite cold. The blue down is cold, and then as it gets warmer, the yellow comes up. And you can see it's quite jaggedy. Uh, so when people say, uh, they show a picture of the reconstruction of the North Atlantic LGM ice front. It's got to be, it's got to be remembered that it is a process not an event, and it's constantly changing, which makes it really hard to model. But there are people working on it. Uh, but here you can see uh, ice coming in right, right to uh, Galicia. And so people living in this area would be out there hunting seals all the time. People living up in here could be out hunting seals. Same over here. And we now know that there are Salutrian people in southern England. But mostly what we've been looking at is northern Spain because all of these guys are interior. They're doing something different, and they have a different toolkit. So um, as that ice moves up and down, it gives you uh, various opportunities to get out. And we think that uh, these people had boats and that they're moving, hunting along the ice. And one of the interesting things about both the ox and the uh, seals, uh, the, the uh, is that there are European populations and then there are Canadian populations today and then. And during the year, uh, during the warm part of the year, the European populations move into this area and the Canadian occupation, your Canadian groups move up here. And uh, if anybody's following along in a boat, getting their caches of meat, and they happen to get in the wrong group of seals going home or ox going home, they're going to end up on the Grand Banks. And they're going to find some pretty neat stuff there. And they're going to figure out where that driftwood's coming from. So they're going to either stay there and enjoy it if there's enough of them, or they're going to go back and say, hey, you won't believe what we saw. <laughs> now, did they do it? Did they have boats? Who knows? Because our evidence, our solid evidence for boats arrests at the time period of nine to 10,000 years ago, and that's when sea levels quit rising. The boats that took people to Australia are long underwater, as are boats from all around the world. And uh, it wouldn't take you long to figure out a boat. Uh, this is a, a historic picture. This is a, a large freighting umiak. Count up the number of people in there. There's, uh, I think, 15 or 17 people. Based on my experience, there's probably a lot of goods down in here, maybe even a dog team or two, half a dozen kids. They may even be pulling another boat that is totally empty of human life, but has a couple dog teams in it. Not that Salutrian guys had dogs, they might have, but uh, I'm just telling you how, how it worked today, or a few uh, um, decades ago. And the boat they're trailing actually usually has a deck that turns into a sled, and they have sails. And of course, of course, the Vikings taught them how to make sails, okay? <laughs> At least that's what I've been told. Uh, maybe. The evidence in Australia is indirect. The people are there, so it's pretty direct, but it is indirect about the boats. Uh, people were going off the coast of uh, Asia and collecting obsidian, as we heard yesterday, and moving back. And they were doing this also, getting out to islands in the Mediterranean, collecting raw materials, taking them back to the mainland 14,000 years ago. This is our best evidence in North America of similar activities. This projectile point found here on the upper strand line of Pleistocene, uh, or of um, uh, the Champlain Inland Sea, right here in Vermont, is made out of raw material 
from Rama Bay in Labrador. Now, you're not going to walk over 3,000 miles of glacier to get there. You're going to come down the St. Lawrence Channel. Probably you're actually going to leave from one of these areas right here, which gives you 1,100 miles of Labrador current to navigate full of icebergs floating southward to get to Rama Bay. You had to know how to tack. You had to know how to sail to get from here to here. Then you had to get home right away because let me tell you, Rama Bay is no place to be in the winter, even today, because that's what it looks like, sheer mountain right into the water, but here's where the rock is. And they were getting it over 12,500 years ago, taking it all the way down into uh, Vermont, today's Vermont. So that indicates to me that we have a pretty good idea of, of sailing, and I suspect our Salutrian guys had sails. I suspect they knew how to tack. And even though the high winds are generally moving west to east, the winds off of the ice are always moving out to sea. So if you're move, even going against current, you can tack back and forth, and uh, some um, Modern day adventurers have done it in one summer with that in mind, just going straight over. Now, our, our Salutrian guys could have camped all winter out there. I mean, it isn't any different there than it was on the coast of Spain, so why bother? How am I doing time wise? Have I run on and on? Uh, at any rate, so we get them here. Now, we have some new sites I want to talk to you about. Here's the Meadowcroft, the old site, Cactus Hill. Uh, this is 16,900 years old by radiocarbon date, 12,000, almost 14,000. These are new sites uh, that have been found uh, by a graduate student that I've worked with since he was 14 in the Delmarva Peninsula area, uh, Miles Point, Jefferson Island, Oyster Cove. I'll run through these rapidly in order. Uh, this is Miles Point. All of these sites are upland sites because at the time that the people were living here, the uh, Chesapeake Bay had not yet moved clear to its present form and we were just upland of the Susquehanna River. But here's our nice geologic section and this bowling Alarod Paleosol is a regional marker. We have it from uh, uh, North Carolina all the way up to Delaware at least, and you can go along the shoreline and when you see this uh, paleo soil, you can pull your boat over and, and get out and, and look for Clovis stuff, which is generally right at the top of the bowling alarod. The bowling alarod was truncated at 10,900 years ago by the Younger Dryas. And look at this lust package we have here. And so all of those Clovis sites, the bowling alarod paleosol may have extended up to here, but there were tremendous dust storms. And all of our Clovis and a bunch of other uh, interesting geologic things that relate to the comet impact theory are found on that contact. And it is a lag con contact. In other words, it all blew out. It's all laying there on one level. And that's probably our problem with that 10,900 year old date is that's because it's eroded to there. Now, the bowling alarod, this can go back a lot, a lot older. Uh, and, and in most areas, people think that the, that the bowling alarod, which is a, this warm period between the LGM and, and the YD, um, conditions were pretty good. Uh, lots of grassland, lots of animals. Uh, but then below it, back into the LGM, Darren saw a big boulder sticking out of the LUS. It had to be a Manuport. I was at a meeting in uh, Texas discussing just this issue, and I get a phone call uh, from Darren, and I was irritated. But I went out and took it, and he said, Dennis, I just got out of the canoe, and I'm looking there, and there's a big rock sticking out of the bowling, or out of the uh, uh, LGM LUS. So well, test it, Darren, see what's there. So we did. And uh, we've been testing it ever since, but this is a situation where we're having some trouble with the landowner. So we have to map things as they appear. But this, all of these artifacts are out of that level 
below the bowling alarod soil. In other words, uh, they're pretty old. Uh, and they fall into the same technology that we get with uh, uh, Metacroft and Cactus Hill. This is a biface. We've got a, a quartzite wedge, uh, uh, these barren quartzite barren spalls, and a polyhedral blade core, and a couple other tools, as well as an anvil and a hammer stone and, a, and another hammer stone. So we have real artifacts. And as we looked at the dates of that paleosol, we find that here uh, in, out in Virginia and, and the dates are a whole lot older than what the bowling alarod is further north. We're looking at 17,000, 17, 15, uh, 21 at Miles Point, and that kind of scared me a bit. And we've got three or four more of these localities being dated right now. But in other words, the Miles Point site is older than Cactus Hill, quite likely. And both of them are totally resembling Salutrian. Now here we have the Clovis level again at the top of the soil. This is at another location called Oyster Cove. And this projectile point here was found eroding out. It's not in that crack, it's over to the side. And it also fits the same model. Uh, and then Jefferson Island, uh, found also eroding out of the um, uh, bowling alarod soil. We have, they're beginning to look a little more clovisy here, except this guy here is a, what the French call a, a micro-grattoir, or a tiny uh, scraper, which we get in Salutrian almost exclusively, and in now pre-clovis and clovis. Uh, overshot flaking, steep retouch snap blades, beeren spalls, flat flaking. This whole assemblage is, is, would fit comfortably along the coast, Cantabrian coastline. And to show how Jefferson Island might relate to Clovis, uh, I'm comparing it to Blackwater Draw, the original Clovis site, and the only difference is the lack of flutes. Other than that, the technology is the same. Now to move back to the uh, site that uh, uh, was disregarded uh, in the recent science paper called the Johnson site, I asked Mike why they didn't use it. They said they didn't know if it was Clovis. Well, the guy that excavated the site had excavated a lot of Clovis sites, so I knew that he, uh, John Brewster, knew that what a Clovis site was. So I called John, I said, hey, what's up, John? So I don't know and we talked for a while. And the problem was is he has three dates from this occupation level of 12,000 years old, and they're just too old for Clovis. Um, <clears throat> so he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll send you the artifacts and you can look at them and tell me if you think they're Clovis. Well, I was a bit surprised. I don't think they're Clovis. These are all classic Salutrian artifacts. Point off Osplan, this type of scraper uh, that's totally flaked over the top, kind of turned to one side and sometimes come to a point here. Uh, beer and technology, uh, the smaller blade technology. But then the reason John thought they were Clovis are these guys, these fluted bases. And he's got nine of them. Uh, here we see four. And in all cases, the platforms were not made correctly to get the flute off. So I'm calling this stuff proto-clovis, and that data 12,000 is probably good. So then when we place these on, uh, radiocarbon dates on a ray, starting uh, in Cantabria with the Spanish sites, all the way down to Montana, we have an overlap of two sigma. So we now have closed the time gap, the technology gap, and all we need to do is find a really old site. Well, this is the latest in our archaeological field inventory of equipment. <laughs> See? It's old, we could afford it. <laughs> we don't have any funding, we have to borrow things. Uh, seriously, uh, 
There's a small um, museum on Gwen Island uh, just off of the Virginia Capes. And uh, they had asked uh, Darren to come down and identify some artifacts that they had been, uh, that had been donated to him, just standard arrowheads. And so he, he's an obliging young man, so he went down and he was telling him what everything was. And he looks over and he sees a case and he sees mastodon bones in that case. And he, oh, wow. So he went over and he looked and holy smokes, there was something in there that really caught his eye. I'm gonna show it to you in a minute. So he called me and uh, I think I'll show it to you right now. How do you like that, guys? Does this look like the one I told you to remember? That's a Salutrian laurel leaf, bigger than heck. But now, why did Darren get excited about it? Well, because it was with mastodon bones, for one. And two, it was found in 1970 by a group of fishermen who were out 40 miles off the Virginia Capes, deep, deep sea scallop fishing. And they were sucking up all this stuff and then you sort it all out when it gets into the bale. And all of a sudden, it, poof, out comes mastodon teeth, chunks of ivory, pieces of bone. And the fishermen got all excited and they were getting the ivory and the teeth and they thought they had a real find there, and then up comes that laurel leaf. Eh, just an old arrowhead. Um, so they gave it to the museum at Gwen Island, along with some of the ivory and a, and a tooth. So if we look at their find, this is uh, Captain Sean's biface, was found right here. Here's Miles Point. This is the Susquehanna River, found right at the mouth. Look at this, these are mastodon finds. This is the Hudson, Hudson Channel. Look at that, was the Hudson Channel during the LGM was a wonderful mastodon locality. And then we're getting mammoths over here. So it's clear to me that we really have to start exploring the continental shelf and we will uh, find a lot of good stuff out there. For instance, this is Assateague area, uh, Barrier Islands. We're coming down the Susquehanna River. At Clovis times, this was the beginning of the, uh, uh, the bay. And here are the Barrier Islands for the Clovis people. Uh, the Chesapeake hadn't started to develop uh, as well during the uh, uh, LGM. And here are the Barrier Islands for the LGM. If you were a, a um, cactus hill hunter and you were out there, you'd be hunting right behind these. And right there is where Captain Sean found the mastodon and the laurel leaf bipoint. That artifact has to be 18,000 plus years old. We should have a radiocarbon date any day because Tom Stafford said the ivory we sent him had the best collagen preservation of any ivory he ever tried to date. And I was hoping he would call me last night and tell me the date. But I can assure you that that is probably the oldest formal tool yet found in the Americas. Thank you very much. What a finish. All right, we'll call our panelists up for Q&A session. If you have questions, please write them on the sheets of paper provided and send them to the aisles and the ushers will collect them.
animate uh, dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And then they has voiceover mm. that is oh. uh, supposed to be the that voice of the remarkable. aliens commenting on what has happened with Earth. I would, so. I would think so. I would think so. No, 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 but there are no human remains, which we find. None. Uh, and the voiceover is, uh, it is it's an original recording of a guy, the guy, the composer, and I actually yeah. forget his name. Modulated, okay. It was nice. Hey, man. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please take your seats? I, I think they're driving us into a hotel. Yeah. Amazing. I wonder what this test of the bearing strike here. Oh, yeah. That's the later oh. occupation. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting question is what happened to these people? Uh, human remains. Yes. They get admixed into yes. the yeah. North, yeah. North American Indian people, or did they die out? Ladies and gentlemen, yes. if you would take your seats, please. Yeah, if, you get, if you can get it right. Yeah, it's a, there you go. As is our custom, we'll give the other panelists an opportunity to ask questions or make observations about the talk. Dr. Marion. Uh, Dennis, I, it's a fascinating hypothesis, and it's very interesting because I've actually never seen, I've been familiar with the Paleolithic literature for quite some time, anyone talk about um, the occupation of those iced over areas in the North Atlantic. Um, and after watching you talk about it, it seems to me, well, yeah, of course, people must have been out there because, as you pointed out, those are rich areas for sealing and, and so on. Um, the question I had is, is, is there any area um, along the coastline of, let's say, anywhere th from Maine to Nova Scotia, perhaps up in Greenland, where the offshore platform is steep enough that one might anticipate that there would be a, a, a currently land-based site that could intercept that population um, through that time? Um, probably not. Uh, because most of it was glaciated. Uh, I would say almost everything we'd look at in that area would have to be underwater. Okay. I will have to mention, though, that uh, uh, a mastodon tusk was dredged up off the Grand Banks uh, this mm. past summer, too. So mm. we know the environment was pretty good up there. Uh, probably similar to the Grand Banks, but may, perhaps a bit lusher because they're further south and more sunlight. I see. And just a quick follow-up, the, the picture of the boat you showed, is that, are, are you guys taking that boat out to start dredging systematically? Is, <laughs> is that? Well, as you might expect, we haven't been able to raise much NSF money for this project. <laughs> no, it, uh, uh, that was just to give you a, a view of what uh, the, the type of ship that sucked up that artifact. Right. Okay, thank you. Like. <laughs> Dr. Pable? So, so, yes, it's a fascinating theory that I, I hear explained to me for the first time. So, so, if the Clovis people, who seem to have been quite numerous and widespread in North America, had their origins in Europe, would one expect to see more evidence of genetic evidence in present-day Native Americans to Europe than what we see, because the evidence really seems to be pointing to, to Asia. Ah, yes. Uh, well, I've given that considerable amount of thought, and I'd like your opinion on some things. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I think the Clovis people ended up being swamped 
by Asians coming in uh, after the I-3 Accord or did open up, which was at about 10,900 years ago. And uh, I think that the uh, Younger Dryas had a major impact on the Clovis population uh, because if they were actually living off that coastal resources, was their major re resource venue, uh, the advent of the Younger Dryas could wipe all of those resources out in one year. And I think that's probably why we see them moving pretty fast uh, westward. And we're pretty sure they're contacting other people. Uh, we've, we've seen some really good evidence of that. Now, uh, but to, to move back, uh, we can see that how Clovis, uh, d after um, the YD, developed into little regional populations, but they were pretty well gone by 9,000 years ago, uh, in terms of their Clovis technology, at least. Now, uh, so I think that what's happened is that uh, the Asians pretty well swamped them. But on the other hand, I'd like your opinion of the mitochondrial legs issue and that uh, originally when found by Wallace and his group, uh, they considered it the oldest uh, DNA uh, marker to come into North America, but I see now they're calling it the youngest. Uh, we do know that amongst the uh, fossil DNA from human remains in North America, X is uh, the most common, and X does not occur in Eastern Asia at all. As far as I know, and the only place that occurs in Asia is in the extreme south, uh, southwestern Asia, which uh, I think is pretty interesting. And we do get it in North America, and it is a minor uh, part of uh, a number of Native American uh, mitochondrial markers. So I was curious to your thoughts about that. Yeah, I'm really not an expert on that. So I'm sort of. Um, in fact, I'm rather skeptical about much of the retrieval of DNA from the remains of modern humans, since it's such a big contamination mm -hmm. issue with that. So I much rather, I don't know enough about it to comment on it, really. Yeah, that, well, that's one of my major problems with the DNA evidence, is it's all modern humans, and we're, we're not looking at, at failed migrations, uh, and, and we're hanging a lot of the directionality on archaeological data that may not be correct, too. So it's, uh, I think there's lots of good stuff that's out there for the graduate students of the future. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Van Hoiste. Uh, yes, uh, let me just thank you for a, a really fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, lecture. I, I very much enjoyed this. I have two uh, uh, simple questions. Uh, the one that you just mentioned about uh, uh, that by 9,500 Clovis people were most probably gone and sw or swamped by, uh, by Asians coming in across the Bering Strait. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just be interested to know on what kind, uh, how do you know that? I mean, for me as, a, as a, an outsider, how, uh, that's a very interesting statement to make that they were most probably gone. Another question uh, uh, which is, uh, how would you uh, answer uh, if someone would ask, couldn't the great similarity or the remarkable similarity between uh, Solutherian tools and a Clovis tool also be explained by, you know, cultural tool evolution, or are they just too, is that, are they so similar that it would be too good to be true? I, I think that, uh, uh, to parse out your question backwards, uh, the, the tool technology is so precise with many hundreds of ways that you go about the reduction systems, and the Clovis and Salutrian ones, they, they're following each other almost identically. And uh, I, I find it uh, a very difficult proposition of independent invention. So I, I see a, a historic relationship. And most flint nappers, uh, flint napping is a language, and it's a conservative language. It doesn't change much through time unless there's a major reason. You're changing your, your total economic uh, pursuits, then you might want to change your, your uh, toolkit. But if you're doing the same old thing, it works, your uncle, your grandfather, your aunt taught you how to do it, you do it. Uh, and you do it with ceremony. Uh, and you do things precisely right, because if you do them wrong, the animal's not going to respect you. The animal's not going to give himself to you. And, uh, boy, that's one thing I really learned with my Inuit friends is that boy, one little thing went wrong, we didn't go whale hunting that day. 
Yeah, that's all there is to it, because, uh, boy, we probably made that one mad at us. And, and it's real, you know, it is absolutely real. Um, now, now, the other uh, issue that I should have brought up a minute ago is, and, and, and it tangentially gets to your question, is that we don't know who the Salutrian people are. We don't know who the Clovis people are. Salutrian came into Europe. We don't know where they came from. There's all of a sudden they're there. They last till about 16,000 years ago, and they're gone. Where'd they come from? Where'd they go? What happened to them? Now, a lot of people think it's a technological shift, but then again, why? But the biggest problem for us and, and the, the geneticists is there are no human remains of either Salutrian or Clovis. So we don't know who they are, uh, they, how they relate to any other genetic group in the world, we don't know. But my guess is they're going to fall into that X haploid group at least. Dr. Dunbar? I was just going to ask about the tools, actually. Um, the, these uh, Clovis and Salutrian points are incredibly finely made. But I just wonder how they compare with the tools coming in from the Bering, over the Bering Strait, and if that tells you anything about the hunting ecology and foraging ecology of the people coming in from the two routes. In other words, you, know, you can see these very finely made tools in the east, so you might argue, you know, because you've got difficult hunting conditions based on seals and, and seabirds. So what you might expect the people coming over the Bering Strait to have the same ecology. Well, they had, maybe, uh, maybe not. Uh, the people came, coming across the Bering Straits, uh, uh, at least if they were coming by coast, had the same ecology. Uh, and they so it's were- It's still pretty icy. Yeah, it's um, still icy. You get ice forming and you have a very uh, rich environment along the uh, uh, southern rim of the north uh, of the uh, uh, Berry Land Bridge. But once again, the tool assemblies, although it's very fine, I mean, there's nothing wrong with mm. the technology. It's just a different mindset and how you make things. Uh, and it's w one manufacturing system versus another. Just a cultural. Yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. it's the same animals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a question from the audience here. Were there women along the trips, along the edge of the ice? Yeah. Uh, were they colonizing, or was it just a bunch of guys out hunting? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I suspect there was at least one. <laughs> <laughs> and she was probably pregnant with twins. <laughs> No, uh, actually, uh, what we find, uh, and we're, Bruce and I are relying heavily on, on, a, on an Eskimo model, and it, while you're hunting the ice, uh, particularly in the winter, uh, it's mostly seal hunting and hunting and breathing holes, the whole family moves out. Uh, and you get people scattered around, you get several families out, because seals don't always go to the same hole to breathe all the time. And, and the more holes you have covered with people waiting with their spears, so when the seal comes up, you nail him. Uh, but if you only have one guy out there, or five guys, well, maybe one guy will get it, but if you got 25 or 30, and the women can do this too, uh, and, and this system of hunting goes, uh, you folks here will like it, uh, um, even in Sweden, uh, in historic times, they were, were using pikes to get seals out of the frozen water. Uh, that, that, that system of hunting lasts right up to uh, uh, historic times and, and even later. Uh, so yeah, there was women out there, and uh, the only time the women didn't come along is when we were after whales or walruses, the, the big, mean, nasty guys. But they were always in camp always in camp, because you cannot survive as a single male out there. You have to have help in preparing your garments, uh, keeping the fire going. It's just, you have the whole band out there and the kids, it's, uh, and, and the model works. I asked one of my Eskimo friends, I told him all about the model, and he looked at me and he said, well, even a white guy could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you have any theories about how or if uh, this relates to South American sites that are rather ancient? 
I, yeah, I, I have several theories. Uh, do I have another hour? Yeah. Oh, go on. <laughs> uh, the South American, there are two real early technologies in South America. One's basically a flake technology. In other words, uh, the people were, were uh, primarily using vegetable fibers and, and perishable materials for artifacts, which you can do in South America. Uh, they're probably not big game hunters. They uh, probably were more gatherers. Uh, and then later on, uh, you get another technology uh, that we see starting up about 14 to 15,000 years ago, in which they made very thick, long, bipointed projectile points, uh, and very thin. Bruce would call it a thickening technique versus a thinning technique that we get with Clovis. That group did not make large blades. Sometimes the projectile points are stemmed, sometimes not. The earliest dates we have, uh, like I say, are around 14,000. That's what we get at Monte Verde. And if you're a technologist, you can see that mindset moving slowly northward along the Pacific coast. And eventually, by 9,000 years ago, we see it in Siberia. Now that one, I'm sure, is going to just quake the trees. But that's the preliminary data as I see it, and I hope that some of you bright young graduate students and students take that one on because I think it might be a fertile place to look. Thank you. All right, one last question here. There have been uh, some mention of the megafauna that lived on the American continent and the sudden disappearance of these. And some people have attributed this to the efficiency of the hunting of the Clovis people, and others to a massive meteor strike. And I believe there was, a, <laughs> there was a TV special on this a year ago, I believe. Do you have any comments on that? Several. <laughs> Do you have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like the meteor strike. Uh, I think it's pretty neat. And uh, I, I think that uh, I'm really glad they're doing it, not me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I recall the first time I heard uh, Firestone uh, give his talk was at a meeting we had in South Carolina, and uh, Russell Graham, the famous paleontologist, and uh, uh, Tom Stafford presented a paper on the Pleistocene extinction. And uh, <clears throat> Basically, they have all of these really nice radiocarbon dates. It's all 10-9, uh, just same time Clovis is moving across the country as fast as they can go. Uh, and then when Tom was done, he says, well, they all went extinct, but there has to be an additional reason that we don't know. And then next paper, Firestone gets up and starts talking about the extraterrestrial impact. Well, it's a good idea, and it might explain a lot. Might not, but by using the scientific method and exploring the alternative hypotheses, I suspect in a couple of years, I might be able to answer this question a little better. But right now, I'm pretty sure Clovis were really good elephant hunters, but I don't think they had much to do with making those animals go extinct. Okay. Well, I think it's about time for break for lunch here. Uh, round of applause once again for Dr. Stanford. Wonderful talk. <laughs>